All right. Welcome, everybody, to Think 60 for this week. This week, I have the pleasure of introducing Darren. He's going to be talking about every single technology that we need to know. Uh, just to confirm that um, for the same practice, if you want to interrupt at any point for clarification, please do. If you've got a question that you think of during the session that you want to park on Slack, we'll address those. And Sydney, feel free to do the same. Pop some questions up on Slack that we'll address at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Every single technology you need to know about. And someone said, what about the internet and websites? We're not going to cover those. <laughs> uh, because they're far too complex and they're probably not going to take off anyway. But um, there are a whole lot of technologies that um, are emerging and they have power to have real impact on society. So we're going to focus on what's emerging. Some of them are a little bit more mature than others. Some of them are very speculative. And we'll kind of go through them all and say, well, how do they work? But also, what does it look like in action? Before I do that, I did want to cover it off um, something that I probably talked about previously, just to remind us. When we're talking about digital transformation, what we're talking about is the change associated with the application of digital technology in all aspects of human society that enables new models, i.e. Um, technology and transformation, or technology when it's been transformative, is about disrupting how things work today. It's not about making things a little bit more efficient or a little bit more effective, doing what you do today better, but rather introducing all new ways in which you can have a positive impact. And so um, when we talk about technology, it shouldn't feel like a tech conversation. It should feel like a conversation about society and governance and compliance and service delivery and vulnerability and equality and all of the things that, um, that you have to think about when you're trying to impact a sustainable development goal. I've also talked about this, but I'll just remind people, when we talk about um, digital transformation, um, as a concept. We didn't start a digital transformation. Um, in, about the, in the late 90s, I worked for an organisation called the Health Insurance Commission, which is now known as the Medicare Program Inside Department of Human Services. And I was responsible for what might have been one of the government's very first digital forms. Um, it was a form, there were a whole lot of text boxes on this new thing called a website that they just put up. They were very excited about it. And when you press submit, um, it said, great, now please print this page out, text forms and all, and here's the address you need to mail it to. Uh, but it was transformative because suddenly people didn't have to go in and get the form and save them a whole trip. Um, and then, you know, slowly but surely, things got better. Um, with digitization, that's kind of where we started, late 90s. Let's take that form, put it online. It was going for a permit, the permit was still being issued in 30 days. Then we moved to the age of digitalization, which was we've actually redesigned our operations. So now you press submit in that form. Everything's more efficient and smooth. Thanks for using our form online. Forget about the 30 days. Here's your permit right away. Digital transformation, there's no more form. We got the data from other agencies you deal with and are capable. We've determined your risk level. You actually don't need a permit, so don't worry about it. By the way, I think you qualify for this new grant. Don't worry about applying. Um, we've already assessed your information and uh, we've used the, the bank account you gave the tax office, so here you go. That's transformation, right? It's playing with the idea of how do we assess risk? How do we personalize things for people? How do we de deliver better services? And how do we get out of the, um, and the, the processing operational traps that we find ourselves in today? So these emerging technologies are all about how do you get to that, that type of disruption, that level of disruption. Um, okay, digital transformation is by definition disruption, disruptive. So technology number one, blockchain. With each technology, there's a couple of things that make it special. So blockchain, you probably know blockchain, um, blockchain's most famous progeny. Um, called Bitcoin. And I've actually forgotten the statistic. Does anyone know the current market capitalization of Bitcoin? I think it's something like 30 billion. <coughs> so, if you took all the Bitcoins in the world and put them in a heap, it would be about 30 billion dollars. Um, 
and yet it doesn't actually exist, right? Um, so how did people start to trust blockchain to the point where there are some pretty serious financial transactions moving through our economic systems? The answer is because blockchain is a technology that does three things. It's basically a database, right? It keeps a bit of data. For Bitcoin, the database says, this identity has this much blockchain, and these are all the transactions that, that, have, um, that have happened in, in, uh, in this financial system. But the reason it's transformative is because, firstly, it's immutable. Once you put something into a blockchain, it is, for all intents and purposes, impossible to change it. So data, once captured, is always captured. Um, the reason behind this is that in any blockchain, the same little database is replicated across thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of servers. And any time a transaction happens, um, that transactions that transaction kind of um, spreads spreads through those those ten thousand servers. Um, if you want to try and hack a blockchain, you have to convince if it's if there are ten thousand servers holding that chain, you have to convince five thousand and one servers all at the same time within the seven minute window to uh, to do this new uh, to to make that change. So as you can imagine, that means you'd have to hack 5,000 separate computers, and you'd have to make the change in all of them. And even when you made that change, um, every time a new transaction is added to the database, um, it's, it creates this, this block of information, like a Lego block of information, and then another block is put on top of it seven minutes later with a whole lot of new transactions. You've actually got to un unpick each block make the hacking change you wanted to make, re-encode the block, and then re-encode all the other blocks and put them back up again. Um, this is so difficult that people trusted 30 billion. So um, blockchain, a database, decentralized, exists on many different um, servers. No central authority, there is no blockchain bank. The trust comes purely from the fact that there are so many bloody copies of this uh, financial ledger out there that nobody can nobody can hack it, and it's transparent. If you want, you can download in one file every single blockchain transaction that has ever happened, right? And you, you could do that in the next five minutes, and you can see every single blockchain transaction that's ever happened. So it's totally out there and transparent. <coughs> Um, and people can hold their own copies if they want to. So how's this being used? Well, Bitcoin is one example, but a really, another really nice example that I quite like, and we had a chat and, and got the, uh, the head of the World of Wildlife Fund in to talk about this, is, um, hey, can you just give me uh, how much time do I have? Yeah, thank you about uh, 20 minutes. Um, World Wildlife Fund. So for the World Wildlife Fund, there, is, there are some huge problems in the fisheries industry. Um, do you know that, that fish are one of the most transited um, and, and kind of um, targeted <coughs> commodities by the mafia around the world? In fact, it's been estimated that about a third of all fish in the Portuguese, you know, a third of all uh, that fish that, uh, that's very popular in Portugal. This is, this is one fish that usually comes in a little can in Australia, but it's very popular in Portugal. No, it's not tuna, it's not anchovies. Sardines. Sardines, that's it. Um, about a third of all the sardines um, in, in Portugal come from an illicit um, organized crime syndicate, which owns entire fishing boats. For example, um, and that is also true for endangered fish. So, fishing is very closely regulated because if you fish too much, you break down the fish supply chain uh, ecosystem, and then a whole lot of other things fall over, and the fish goes extinct. So, how can you make it so that you know as a consumer the fish you've bought came from a place that was um, sustainable? And the answer is, World Wildlife Fund has got this blockchain solution. You catch a fish, 
or you catch 50,000 fish, and every one of them gets this little reusable RFID tag, basically a tag where you put a scanner on it and, and um, it, it says I'm fish number 327415A2B. So suddenly, we've given a fish an identity, which is a really beautiful thing. Um, and then that identity is scanned at every part of the supply chain. So when it moves from the fishing boats to the depot, when it moves from one depot to another depot, and all of these are written on the blockchain, and the blockchain is unhackable, immutable, transparent to anyone who wants to see it. Um, at some point, the fish might get cut up and then put into packaging, and then the packaging, you know, you lose the RFID tag, and instead you get this QR code, like a barcode, and suddenly it's still traceable back to when the fish was one, one whole fish until finally it reaches um, coals or, or willies. And then um, you as a consumer can take an iPhone app or an Android app and scan this QR code and you'll know that along every step of the way um, where this fish has been. And in that way you can validate that the supply chain is ethical and sustainable. One of the brilliant things about this is that not everybody has to be in the same system. As long as you can scan that barcode and send a little message to the blockchain and run a new transaction, anybody can add to that transaction. So, um, pretty, pretty incredible use. And in fact, anytime there is a supply chain that you want to track, um, particularly across lots of parties um, who have lots of different systems and live in lots of different places, um, you can use blockchain to do that. So, it's already being used in a pilot project by WWF where they are um, getting Indonesian fishing boats to catch fish and then trace all the way through to a UK retailer. I think it's Tesco. I might be wrong. I think it's Tesco. Um, so that's blockchain. That's our first new technology. Things to remember about it. It's a database. It's immutable. It's, um, it's decentralized. And by and large, it's transparent. Okay, um, the second thing, I'm going to get into trouble for this because people are going to say that's not a technology, data is not a technology, but I'm, I'm putting it in here anyway because technologists tend to enjoy talking about it. Big data isn't just a database with lots and lots of information. It's lots of data from different databases all brought together so that you can see across all of these information sources. Um, and I'll give you an example in a sec. Sometimes people talk about data lakes. That is when you basically just take a whole lot of databases and drop them into one massive data system. Don't try and join them up, it's just that, like, okay, now we've got all this data in one place. Um, as opposed to a data warehouse, where you actually work out what the data is that you're putting into it and you try to create one mega data set. Very, very hard to do that, but um, um, that's what, it, what the dream of a data warehouse is. So let's talk about um, this one. So at the moment, my health record contains lots of information about individuals, people's health. So you can derive a whole lot of information at a societal level just by looking at all that data. Right? And then you can then say, okay, well, we see that people with this type of health condition tend to develop that type of health condition too. You couldn't necessarily develop that by a clinical process uh, or a controlled, a traditional clinical experiment where you may look at a thousand people, but when you suddenly you've got 20 million people's worth of health information, you can derive these new insights that just wouldn't otherwise have been possible. And then the really interesting thing happens, and this is where we get into the real power of, of uh, big data, is what happens if you take all of that information and you also take a whole lot of spatial information and you take a whole lot of information about where people went to school and what they studied, and you take you know other pieces of information that's con that, when you put it together, show people's lives beyond just a clinical life. Suddenly, you may be able to draw insights like people who live in this type of city tend to develop um, heart disease. And so the solution to heart disease may not be a clinic or a diet solution, it may in fact be a city design solution. So um, big data is not only that you get a, a huge view of a particular topic, 
but push beyond that topic to see what other previously unidentified messages there may be to each other with the topic. Big data is going to be as influential in policy design and service design and administrative design as any any other revolution that has happened in the last hundred years. Um, people don't realise it, but the, the notion of big data will have the impact of the first book being made, or the internet being made. It's just that we're very early in the, in the process, and so we don't quite know how to exploit it properly. Automation. And there's a lot of discussion around automation. Um, automation as a technology, you tend to think about assembling cars, and that is an automation technology. It's often associated with robotics, physical things being created. Um, in a government context, what automation is about is using natural systems to make things happen without the requirement for any type of user experience, or I uh, sometimes call it the no experience. Right? There's no user experience associated with this. Um, <coughs> A great example is single touch payroll. Has anyone heard of single touch payroll? Yep. It's caused quite quite the stir in government and this is how it works. It's, instead of paying your reporting your payroll uh, to the tax office and any business that's above twenty employees needs to do that. And they need to write a report to and send it through. Instead what they've done is they've worked with software developers to basically work out everything that needs to be in that quarterly report but on a weekly basis and just let that information start trickling through. As a business, instead of getting a tax tax agent and doing a whole lot of work trying to work out your report every couple of months, you don't you literally don't need to do anything anymore. Um, not only does it mean that this is now all totally automated by clever arrangement of systems and data, but it is also um, enabling new types of compliance. So instead of the tax office saying every quarter, um, how's everybody going? Is anyone doing the wrong thing intentionally or unintentionally? Ah, this person's done the wrong thing, they made a mistake, but they've made that mistake for three months and now we're gonna we're gonna hit them. Instead they can intervene much earlier and say, last week they said this and that doesn't make sense. Let's just touch in with them and make sure that everything's okay. So it actually enables a new mod type of compliance. So um, when we think about automation, feel free to think about robots and automatic assembly of cars or iPhones, but also think about how can we take, say, a reporting burden and turn it into something that literally has no more human experience or human interface to it anymore. And that's a powerful idea. So, there's a new role that didn't exist in government about four or five years ago and it's, it's emerging, and you'll hear it. It's called the cloud architect. And this is a role that has been based on this notion that um, uh, the cloud is the new way that government should um, create and implement technology. So for those of you who have been asleep for the last decade, um, the cloud is basically, instead of me owning my software, or me owning my database, or me owning my platform or infrastructure. I'm gonna pay somebody else to do it. I won't maintain it. All I will do is, um, is that a child? Is that Hannah? <laughs> <laughs> Not expected that, hi. <laughs> um, in, <laughs> in, um, Instead, the cloud, it is inside the cloud. Um, so your ownership becomes about how you configure something that's managed by somebody else and how you use it. The cost savings associated with that are massive, but they're nothing in comparison to the fact that you don't need to grow expertise in your own organization anymore. Instead, you can have another organization that is absolutely expert in the thing that you're getting from the cloud, and they can drive the solution for you. Um, the other thing that's really important about a cloud from a government perspective is the difference between capital and operational expenditure. So as the financially minded among us would know, a capital investment is an investment where you're creating something new like an IT system, and operational expenditure is when you're just keeping things going. Um, cloud represents the largest shift from capital to operational budgeting in government, probably in its history. 
because you don't consider cloud as a capital expense, you consider it as an operational expense. Now, if you think about the fact that the government spends billions of dollars, or used to spend billions of dollars every year in capital investment in technology, that's all shifted to the operational side of the book. So the whole financial model has changed, not to mention the huge savings that are coming off the capital um, budget and moving into the operational budget. So, um, Department of Finance has said to government, you will use cloud, and uh, that's what's happening. A really good example of this is the New South Wales GovDC cloud. So, um, it's, it's this marketplace. What they do is they go and negotiate a whole lot of contracts for everything from CRMs to databases to um, uh, and storage, computational power, um, access to data, all types of things. Um, and then they make it available from this, this, one, this one hub called GovDC. And then any um, New South Wales government organisation, I think they now allow um, NGOs to use it as well, can instead of buying their own systems, um, tap into this. And um, there are now New South Wales government agencies that basically have no IT systems of their own anymore. All of their IT exists in the cloud. Um, which is crazy, like the whole idea of this would have felt impossible 10 years ago. So we might see in our lifetimes the first IT system free federal agency where their entire technology is outsourced to various cloud vendors um, and all of the technology people are worried about are things like what's the configuration, what data are we dealing with, and that's pretty exciting. Artificial intelligence and machine learning. It, it is impossible to overstate how impactful artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to be in government. In the next 10 to 15 years, um, it is going to change how government um, designs programs, how it designs law, how it targets services, and um, and um, how humans, well, how citizens interact with government departments. And we're already seeing the beginning of this. Has, has anyone dealt with a virtual assistant? Yeah? Um, so if you go to the tax office, um, I can't remember um, her name. Alex. Alex. Ask Alex. Right. For some reason, all the virtual assistants in, um, in the public service in Australia have been got an A name, and I think they're all, all female. That's about right. Um, not sure why, that's just the way it's happening. Um, IP Australia recently put out a virtual assistant um, with a training badge. Said, this is whatever her name was, Alex. Uh, she's new at her job at the moment, but she's learning. So, you know, um, she's, she's in training. If you uh, ask her a question and you don't get what you want, sorry about that, but she'll get better over time. So imagine that, a, a computer program with a training badge, something different about that, right? And the reason why, why Alex is learning is because she's a smart algorithm. Over time, she tries, she predicts what people might need. And if she gets it wrong, she learns that she got it wrong, and then she tries to do better next time. Um, so when you think artificial intelligence, what you're thinking is what is sometimes called a prediction engine. They look at data, they try to learn as much as possible, and that learning turns into a prediction that they make. And if that prediction is right, that's a learning experience for them. If it's wrong, it's a learning experience for them. And um, probably one of the, uh, I think the AIs that you may have um, interacted with is this um, Google, Google program where I think it's called Google Draw. Yeah. 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 Right. So it says, it says draw something, and you draw something, and then it says, I reckon that's a trombone. And the reason why I can make that prediction is because it has looked at millions of trombones and drawing of trombones, photos of trombones, and it has worked out what a trombone looks like. And then when you draw your your inept trombone. It can take all of that data and make a prediction that the thing that your drawing looks most like is a trombone. And one of the things is every time it gets it wrong, 
And then it, um, it learns from that. So the next dodgy drawing, which kind of makes the same trombone mistakes, we go, I reckon that guy's trying to draw trombone. Um, so it's pretty incredible. In the same way that it could recognize trombones, it can be taught to recognize things like illicit transactions. If a crime syndicate is trying to import drugs, it can take a look at all of the factors associated with that import and say, based on imports that we have uh, captured before, based on um, which have been illicit or illicit, we think that this one actually looks a bit illicit. So stop that one and have a look inside the box. Um, there is a pretty famous story going around at the moment about um, a, a professor who has worked out an algorithm that allows you to predict if someone is having a manic episode. So a manic episode um, basically means that there are certain things, um, uh, certain behaviours that you're more likely to evidence or show um, associated with certain um, uh, mental health conditions. And um, based on what you put onto Facebook or Twitter, this artificial intelligence can just scan all of those and say, that looks like somebody who's having a manic episode. And it's really powerful because um, if you wanted to, you could maybe say, you haven't been diagnosed, but just so you know, we think that you might be having this issue, so go and, uh, go and see your GP. Or, to put an evil slant on it, it could be used by a large corporate to say, when people are having a manic episode, they're more than likely to make an impulse buy. So let's put a whole lot of really big impulse buy things or gambling sites in front of them and increase um, increase flow through. So huge potential for good and evil. And in fact, even the intervention one could be evil, right? Because you know, like, it's, there's no social license to do that type of thing, just to go to someone and say, go see your GP because we think you might be having a manic episode. So um, how is the AI doing that? <clears throat> Again, it's scanning huge amounts of Twitter and social media information. It's putting, working out which of its predictions were previously true or false. It's working out, um, and then it's basically learning from that. Um, and that's incredible. And the ethical challenges of AI are even more incredible. Now you'd say, Okay, but is that really going to happen? Well, Abram, you found a, um, a Canadian government RFT recently, which was looking to see if we could use AI to uh, to identify people who were suicide um, risk or vulnerable to to suicidal ideation. Um, so governments are noticing, and even in those types of um, ethical quagmires, they're starting to act and Australia will be acting soon too. Digital engagement. This is one we're probably all familiar with, but I don't think we've realized how powerful using digital channels like social media and things like RSA or things like, um, like Slack channels can be in terms of digital engagement. And the example that I like to use is about Iceland's constitution. So some of you might know that Iceland had a meltdown around the, the time of the GFC um, because its banks were holding onto massive amounts of dodgy subprime debt. And when the subprime market got ripped away, the <coughs> banks pretty much all fell over. It was actually the worst affected country in the world. And um, they decided that they were going to bail the banks out even though the banks had acted incredibly irresponsibly. And uh, the citizens didn't really like this, so they held a revolution and the government fell. It was called the Pots and Pans Revolution because thousands of people wound up standing outside of the old thing, which is the Icelandic parliament, banging pots and pans um, in the snow. And after this happened for a couple of weeks, the government said, okay, we surrender. And they elected a new government and the government, new government said, um, corruption is and and dodgy practices are so woven into our country that we can't do anything until we rewrite the constitution. So um, they got a constitutional reform project happening, and they got this group of, of nominated people by the public together, and they spent many weeks rewriting the constitution. 
And one thing that they did was they actually started to crowdsource what should be in the Constitution. So there were these Facebook groups, heavily used. Um, people would say, the, the group would say, this week we're looking at fishing and the ownership of fish catchments. And then thousands of people from across Iceland will be putting in their um, ideas about how things should be written and sometimes even drafting new constitutional text. And you would see at the end of the week or the end of the fortnight what the latest version of the constitution was looking like and how it incorporated that conversation. So there's a very low latency between the engagements and its implementation and what was effectively the constitution's prototype. Um, now that constitution has been looked at by the most respected constitutional analysts and they generally agree that it's the world's best constitution which is amazing because it started basically from the Norwegian constitution, Iceland cut and pasted the entire thing, replaced Norway with Iceland and that was the original. This one um, is written in plain English, it covers all the things that people were worried about and it was heavily driven from, from a Facebook engagement. Now, there was a referendum, and a referendum passed. And then one of the old governments got back in to power again, and they basically killed the whole project. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a lot of people in Iceland who want to come, and so I think in, in the next couple of years, that, that crowdsourced. Uh, I, I couldn't tell the story and then say everything was perfect, but but um, there's no question that um, this is an extreme use of digital engagement. Now, if you think about the projects that we work on with governments, often we'll say, oh, no, we, we can't open it up like that. We can't just open it up to the mob. And then what you can say is, well, actually, when they tried to do that with the Constitution of Iceland, they created the world's best ever constitution. So you should definitely let us use digital engagement to decide if fish permits should be taken 30 days or 14 days. Um, just a couple more. API architectures. So APIs have been around for a while, but the way they're being used today makes them into an emerging thing. An API is basically an interface that allows a machine to talk to another machine. A couple of examples of APIs. Um, if you've ever been to data.gov.au, you'll know that there's lots of open data that lives on those websites. And you can go and download the data set and, and use it. Or you can have your program on your computer connect to a government data set and draw information in that way. The way that's happening is via an API. Another example, um, on your personal website about tropical fish, you can have a link to Amazon and, uh, and a tropical fish book, and you can in one click on your website buy an Amazon book, right? The connection between your website and Amazon, that is, um, that's an API. But um, what's happening now is that governments are using APIs to go beyond uh, those types of more trivial transactions to say, can we actually put APIs on everything? Can we take every data set and put an API on it so that anybody with the right permission can get it? Can we take any service that um, we as government put out there and put an API on it, and instead of us being the service deliverer every time, um, maybe someone else could do it? Um, for example, rather than having to submit your tax return to the tax office, maybe submit your tax return um, via to this other provider who then does a whole lot of processing for you and says, you sure you want to do this? You know, check this out. But once, once you're happy with it, we'll submit it for you and it'll be a much nicer process. What's actually happening there is the government has says, we're, we're going to outsource our front end um, to anyone in the world. <laughs> and they might be able to provide a better experience than we could, and that's because we put APIs on everything inside the tax office, so, um, so now anyone can play with our stuff. Isn't that just what tax accountants do? Um, yeah, absolutely, and that's driven by APIs. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't do my tax. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, okay, great. Um, yeah, so tax accountants do do that, and um, what they used to have to do is they'd have to log into an ATO system, 
now AGO has put APIs in their system, so instead they can just do it straight from Maya. Um, and it gets even more sophisticated than that, so it's pretty cool. Um, one example is Singapore. So they've got this, this, um, this system called APEX, which stands for the API Exchange. And they basically have a rule. If you're a government agency, you have to put an API on your data, unless you've got a good reason not to. And inside this API exchange, will you can say who's got permission to use it or not to use it. Which means that now, instead of a government agency A negotiating for 12 months with government agency B about whether or not it's allowed to access this data, instead, in five minutes, it can go through the API exchange and get the data that it wanted. And you might think that I'm being a bit hyperbolic. Surely it doesn't take 12 months for a government agency to give them, um, to give, yeah, and you're right, I am being hyperbolic. That is much, much slower than the real thing. Um, for um, jurisdictions in Australia to share water data with the federal government, it was a 12-year process to create that memorandum of understanding. So instead of 12 years, 12 minutes, that's what API exchanges and within government do. Um, I think this is the last one. Um, this is the Internet of Things. So an Internet of Things is a new word that basically says you take something, you put in a sensor, that sensor is allowed to wirelessly connect to a network, and then that network is going to work out what's being sensed and do something with it. Um, and suddenly you have all of these smart objects and smart devices. One example of Internet of Things, do people know about um, now, which running program was it that was scandalously in the news recently? A Strava? Strava, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So what's, what happened with Strava? It's a running program. And it turns your phone into a tracker about where you run and how fast you run it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Or US Army? US Army, that's right. Suddenly, they decided to create this dashboard which showed where the world was running. Suddenly, there were these people who were running for about four hours a day, all together in a well-defined pack, in the middle of the desert in the Middle East. And, uh, and they were in like 20 kilometer runs, it was amazing. And then somebody said, you know, I reckon that's probably a secret military base. And in fact, it was every single secret military base um, in, in every country anywhere in the world. Um, so Strava took that down and, and the, um, the military were told you probably shouldn't use that in the future. <laughs> um, but um, that's, that's the dark side of the Internet of Things. Let's look at the light side. Um, Dubai Smart City Strategy um, had this brilliant thing where they turned parking meters into smart Internet of thing, Things. Things, things. So here's the program. Um, you're going to vaccinate your child. So you book online and say, I'm going to vaccinate. And the internet of them, the smart city says, fantastic. Um, download this program so we'll know where your car is and we'll help you get to the place where you need to get to. We've allocated you to your closest vaccination center. And when you arrive there, um, as you're going there, we'll make sure there's a parking spot available for, for you. So it'll be unavailable to anybody else. And then when you arrive, it'll suddenly become available and you can go in there. And then don't worry about paying the parking meter and we'll know that it's you because you've got a smart device, got a phone in your car. And so um, it's on us, that parking, we won't charge you. And so the people have this brilliant thing where they can just run out of work, you know, get their kid from daycare, go over, there's a parking right in front of the vaccination facility, they get vaccinated and they come back out and they don't have to pay anything. And I think that's pretty cool. That's running right now in Dubai. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this. I'm putting out about 15 minutes left, um, and I wanted to have a moment of application um, where you guys actually think about how one of these could be used in some projects that you've worked before. But before I do, are there any questions or any comments or other things that people want to add into the conversation? Uh, so I noticed Janine's posted a whole bunch of questions, so I wanted to just hand the mic over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually not very tech savvy and I decided to use Slack today, so I feel like it's fitting. Out of probe, yeah. Um, 
I had a question around, and I suppose it probably applies to quite a few of these, but it, it sort of sparked when we were talking about big data, which obviously can be really transformative and really, really powerful. But how do we manage that application ethically? You did talk about a lot of these things being used for good and for evil. Um, so how do we stop it from being used for evil? It's a really great question. and. Um, there's a concept, as I'm going to answer that in, in three different ways. The first answer I've got is about something called social license. So social license as a concept was actually created by an industry that I'm just going to be upfront and say I, don't, I generally don't like very much, although there are exceptions, uh, the mining industry. And um, the mining industry realised that when it dug a big pit mine somewhere near a community, it was probably going to be causing that community harm in terms of you know, smoke and uh, large trucks coming through and noise and uh, destruction of the viewscape of the, of the place. So um, there was this concept that emerged called social licence to operate, which is basically the mining company going and having discussions with local communities and saying, we're going to do this to you and you want to be upfront about it but we also want to do some nice things for you to make up for it. So what is it going to take for you to license us in a social sense, you know, i.e. say yes, um, to make this mine? Um, and therefore please protest a little bit less and, uh, and maybe give us a chance of making it happen. So social license to operate actually uh, became part of a lot of legislation as well, and, those types of, and it became quite significant. The government adopted the notion of social license um, and in fact, Prime Minister and Cabinet right now are having lots of conversations about this. And the question they're asking is, how do we know that we have permission from, um, from the people of Australia to use data in certain ways? And it's not a, a homogenous question either, right? Because different groups in the community might have different opinions about what's okay versus what isn't okay. Not only that, but we know that legislation moves on a much slower cycle than, um, than people's willingness to use or not use data for, for their own convenience. Um, and so um, um, establishing social license, um, is it okay to do this? One of the ways to do it is to have consent. So the government is allowed to do something, but first the person must have informed consent and just hint. There's no such thing as informed consent when the consent form has 45 pages of small text on it. That's not consent. Um, so, so informed consent is one way to establish social license. The other way is to make sure that there is a vigorous discussion of the potential harms and working out how to mitigate them. For example, we wouldn't want, um, we might want um, companies to be able to create cooler interfaces and more useful interfaces to my health record. We probably don't want that company to also be your health insurer, right? Um, so trying to work out um, what those harms could be. So social license is one thing. Um, we've talked a bit about, and, and I've led some of these in the past, um, Bondi Beach conversations, actually thinking through some of the scenarios um, when you're sitting in Bondi Beach or where ethical challenges might lie, rather than trying to work out if you're going to um, um, I should probably explain one no beach conversation, shouldn't I? Okay, I'll do that. Um, there's this phenomenon that happens. Say you're climbing Mount Everest, you reach the top, great moment, then you walk back down again, and on the way, you see somebody lying in the snow. They're exhausted, they may broke their leg, they're not going to survive the night, and you have to decide whether or not you carry them down. And there's two places you can decide, and if you do carry them down, you're likely going to die. Now, this isn't just a, um, this isn't a scenario that's pure makeup. This happens a reasonable amount in Mount Everest. When do you make that decision? You make that decision either on the mountain, or you make it four weeks before you leave while you're sitting on Bondi Beach discussing your upcoming trip. And so when we talk about Bondi Beach conversations in, in Think Place, we talk about how do you engage people in those complex, great conversations will they have all the time when they need to practice, put into practice a decision. And I think one thing that we can do with government is to actually really help them understand um, how subtle harms can be so that when they're faced with those decisions, they're really thinking about some of those difficult scenarios rather than them just making a knee-jerk reaction. And I think we've seen knee-jerk reactions because they've seen really awful things as well. 
Um, the third way I'm going to answer that question is that there are new ways of reducing the privacy um, implications of use of data. So one example is Data61 has come up with a system where if you want to make a decision about someone based on their data, you never actually get access to that data. You can put a query in to the system, you won't see the data, the query will then kick something back out, it'll be like a yes or a no. For example, I don't want to know if this person um, uh, has had lots of parking tickets and has uh, DUIs before, but is this person trustworthy in the car? So I'll put that out to the, to the driving department, traffic department. They won't tell me if I've had a DUI or if I've got a clinical condition that puts at risk my risk of drive, my ability to drive, or if I'm a speeder. All they'll tell me is, no, we're but worried about this person. So the question is, how can you minimize the impact, or how can you minimize the amount of data exposure that a citizen has in the decision-making process? And things are getting more sophisticated about that. Uh, none of these are easy answers. But one thing that I will say, the best way to establish social license is to go out there and talk to the actual community, which is why co-design and user research are so important in some of these ethical dilemmas. In that last instance, where's the natural justice? Where's, where's the natural justice component if, if you're using AI and machine learning and a, and a machine or system is making decisions, you kind of lose that ability to have an individual conversation about what the extenuating circumstances or what's going on in their lives at the moment that might have meant they behaved a certain way. And I don't know, Direction. it worries me a little bit. Yeah, um, this is a real a real issue. And there, um, <coughs> the place where this came up most strongly is in the justice system where parole decisions were being made by artificial intelligences. <laughs> And those decisions were then being handed to parole boards who then need to decide whether or not to run with that. And um, if it was a bad decision, they would, they would generally run with it because they didn't think they were as smart as a machine. Even though the machines actually had accidentally introduced um, bias. Um, so um, um, in, the, in the EU, um, there has been legislation um, enacted which is called um, right to explanation and right to explanation legislation means that a government department cannot make an administrative decision that affects a person in some way with some exceptions around national security without being able to explain that decision in a process that's kind of similar to freedom of information now that actually is a real dilemma and I'll tell you why. On the one side, it means that the issue that the, the risk that you just talked about, which is government decides something for me but it doesn't take into account who I am as a person. So that kind of controls that because now a person can find out why a decision was made. The other side is that artificial intelligences which make these decisions in volume are so complex that no human can understand why they're making these decisions. Um, the math behind it and the amount of data that's driving it makes it almost impossible to explain artificial intelligence decisions in many cases, not all, but many cases. So if there is right to explanation legislation enacted in the EU or in the future, or certainly in Australia, that might actually mean that it limits what you can use artificial intelligence to do. So even though it would be benign, um, because the decision making is so complex, um, you have to limit the artificial intelligence capability, i.e. forego opportunities to intervene for public good. So um, both, both sides of that ethical dilemma are correct, and both sides need to be dealt with, but nobody's managed to deal with both sides yet. <laughs> Can I just pick up on the last thing you said? Because there is actually a group, I think they're, they're at Carnegie Mellon, that has now developed a class of neural networks that can explain what they are doing to people. So they, they communicate, I think through an API probably, with other neural networks, and then develop a verbalization that is understandable for people as well. So that's, there's the next class of that AI. Is yeah, so that addresses, to some extent, the, the one issue you just mentioned. I love the fact that, um, that the solution to the problem of AI was it's to use AI, AI. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact that is absolutely how this is going to happen. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the pattern that we're going to see, that's, that's incredible.
Five more minutes. Look, I might, I might take more questions, and then I might I'll, I'll tell you what this this is, but I'm not going to I'm not going to prosecute it here. Instead, you can maybe have a think about it and um, have a chat with me out of session if you'd like to tell me what results you got. But maybe one more question. <laughs> What are the risks of AI being out of control? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Elon Musk says, says and firmly believes that AI is going to end humanity. Um, and he, but what does he know? He's never done anything important. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, he only does it in Gerald meetings. <laughs> um, It's, it's a really interesting question. Um, there's been great work done by Isaac Asimov in the 70s to try and work out how to program um, uh, limits, harm limits into robotics that are actually coming back into vogue at the moment. Um, but, but, I'm, but I'm not sure, sure what that's going to look like. Um, the, I'm not sure of the answer to that question. But I'm going to I'm going to transform it slightly, which is what is to prevent a, um, a government from using an, the power of AI to destroy another civilization? Um, because I don't know how we stop a rogue AI, but um, I don't think it's going to go well for us. Um, but the really scary thing is that right now there are bad actors around the world who are using artificial intelligences to do things like micro-targeting of propaganda, um, like hacking of systems that might be considered unhackable, um, otherwise unhackable, um, and to, um, uh, to, to, do various, um, to do various other bad things. And I think there's going to be a national security conversation, which I hope that we're, we're a part of in some way, um, to say, um, what are the vulnerabilities in our national systems that we we haven't thought of? And that could be something around um, um, social engineering. You know, we might have the strongest systems um, around um, that will stop a person from breaking into another system and hacking something. But we're also machines, and we can absolutely be hacked. Um, just by the right message at the right time on the right subject in the right place. And these things won't happen um, like a bolt from the blue, but right now there are almost certainly artificial intelligences that are trying different techniques to influence large populations, making mistakes, are learning from it, and are algorithmically evolving using a machine learning um, learning model to become more and more effective at deploying natural language um, incursions into foreign countries. And we've already seen the beginning of that um, with the um, uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal, which provided a whole lot of detailed information, which was then fed into learning models for, um, for the Russians, um, uh, Russian Internet Research Agency. That was then turned into natural language um, injections into social media using a large botnet army, um, which, was then, which was also micro-targeted at swing states. So it sounds like science fiction, and um, the FBI believes that's absolutely what happened, and that's just what we know about. So weaponized AI um, is not going to be where you drop the bomb or how do you hack the system, but how do you hack the people? And there's a really great conversation that we need to have about that, um, and we're not having it fast enough yet. On that happy note, I think we're done. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> so, Darren, thank you so much for taking the time to prepare today's Think 60. It's um, been really informative to learn about the different emerging technologies, every single one of them. <laughs> and um, really interesting conversation that I think only needs to be picked up, not finished here. So, yeah, thank Great. you so much. And, and the thought I'll just leave everyone with is um, how do you take this, this conversation? and translate what you've learned into an intervention in the projects that you run so that people understand 
what's possible and not just what you can do today. Thanks. Thanks, Karen.